Let's uh, talk about nerve agents. First of all, what are nerve agents? <laughs> well, first of all, this, you've seen this two or three times already, just to remind you that we're going to be dealing with liquids and vapor. Um, nerve agents are liquid. Anybody that calls them nerve gas in this class will go stand in the corner for 15 minutes. It's a bad word. It's a nerve agent. So we're going to be talking about liquid exposure and vapor exposure. A nerve agent is something that causes biologic effects by inhibiting an enzyme. That enzyme, acetylcholinesterase, then cannot do what it's supposed to do, which is to hydrolyze or break down a neurotransmitter acetylcholine, which is the transmitter in the cholinergic part of the nervous system. This excess acetylcholine, a normal neurotransmitter, is what causes the damage. So it's an indirect effect, an effect on an enzyme which then doesn't do something and the resulting excess product is what causes the damage. Now, if we accept that definition, I'll bet each of you has dealt with or handled nerve agents. There are two classes of compounds that do this. One's the carbamates and one's the organophosphates. And among the carbamates are antilarium, neostigmine or prostigmine, pyridostigmine or mestinon. What's the military revel relevance of mestinon, or of uh, pyridostigmine? Okay. The military specific use for this is pretreatment for nerve agents, which Dr. Newmartin is going to explain to you in great detail in a little while. Mestinon, of course, has been used for many decades in treatment of myasthenia gravis. If any of you use seven, you know what it is? Yep. Bug spray. Good. How about malathion? Yep. Use that? Any of you garden probably have used that. And then there's what we refer to as the nerve agents, as though they're different than these other things. All these things do the same thing, biologically, cause the same effects. The major difference is that the nerve agents are many times more potent. That is, it takes much less of a dose, a smaller dose, smaller amount. These are the nerve agents. GA or Taboon, GB, Saron, GD, Soman, GF, no other name, and VX. <coughs> this class of compounds been known for about a century and a half, and the toxicity wasn't recognized too much. Until 1936, a German scientist, Dr. Gerhard Schrader, who was looking for more potent insecticides in a private chemical company like DuPont or wherever, came across something that was extremely potent. He knew it was potent because he got effects from just holding the test tube of it under his face. The law in Nazi Germany at that time said these things had to be turned over to the government, which he did, and the government developed it and put it in munitions. Two years later, Dr. Schrader 
synthesized another compound even more potent than the first. This was GB, and this too was in munitions during World War II. Germans did not use them, as I mentioned this morning. In 1944, another German scientist first synthesized SOMAN, or GD, and in the early 50s, a British scientist working again in private industry synthesized VX. The British were not in an offensive chemical mode at that time, or have they been since? Uh, they gave that to the United States. The United States developed it, put an awful lot of it into munitions, which are now we're trying to destroy. Well, the last class pointed out that you cannot have a lecture on a chemical agent without showing plenty of chemistry and a lot of chemical structures. And they urged us to be sure and show you lots of chemistry and a lot of chemical structures. So there's one. I do have a point in showing this. This is Taboon or GA, and I want you to notice this grouping up here, I think it is. This one off the oxygen. That's an ethyl. You look down here, it's a little bit bigger. And here on SOMAN, it is very big. And this comes into importance later on when we talk about therapy. Because because of this side chain, this large group, the oxime 2-PAM chloride is relatively ineffective against SOMAN inhibited cholinesterase. So an oxime does not work too well, and this is the reason, because of this side group. The other thing on here is that onset is very rapid. That's the vapor. Onset is almost instantaneous from vapor. Now this one, VX, is a little bit different, different structure. It has a sulfur in it, which is immaterial. LD50, we don't talk much about VX vapor because it's relatively non-volatile, although large amounts or with heat, it will vaporize. Onset is much longer. It has to go through the skin. And the LD50 is 10 milligrams. Well, can you visualize 10 milligrams of VX? I'll help you. There it is. Covers two of the columns on Lincoln Memorial on a penny. If that were placed on the arms of everyone in here, half of you would be dead in a short period of time. These are the toxicities. LCT50s, BX is the most toxic, GA is the least toxic. This is liquid on skin. There are 10 milligrams you saw, and progressively a lot more as we go up into the more volatile agents. This is quite large because GB will evaporate from the skin before it will penetrate through the skin, unless it's occluded by clothing or something. Then it goes right through the skin. Nerve agents are clear, colorless liquids, not gases. Clear and colorless. They are said to be tasteless, and I'm not quite sure who said that. <laughs> they are said to be odorless. Most are said to be odorless, and again, I don't know who said that. Um, GA and GD are said to have a, a slight odor. Major Madsen says GB does, um, but nonetheless, no warning here. All of them penetrate skin, all of them penetrate normal clothing, with the exception, as I said, some of the G agents may evaporate off skin. G agents, most are volatile or evaporate readily. GB is by far the most volatile, and it evaporates like water. They don't just go poof up into the air like gasoline does. In fact, that probably saved a lot of people on the Tokyo subways because it evaporated relatively slowly. If it had gone poof and filled the whole car with all the, v the GB they had on that car, everybody would have had a high concentration. All chemicals in munitions, and I was trying to think if somebody can get me on an exception to this, but all chemicals in munitions are liquids. And the shell explodes, off comes 
liquid, off comes aerosol, which quickly evaporates, and off comes vapor. So you end up with liquid or vapor. But everything, as far as I know, everything in munitions is liquid, except for BZ, which is not. Okay, the most volatile evaporates like water. These are a definite vapor hazard. VX, on the other hand, is like light motor oil. Not too volatile, evaporates very slowly, presents very little vapor hazard. We could probably put a couple teaspoons of VX out here on the floor and it wouldn't hurt any of us. You want to try it? Trust me. <laughs> Physiology. We all know this. I'm going to go through it quickly. An electrical impulse goes down a nerve, releases that neurotransmitter across the synaptic gap and stimulates the organ. And the organ functions. And the function of that organ is stopped because the neurotransmitter is gone. It's destroyed by acetylcholinesterase. The end organ might be a muscle, a gland, or another nerve. And we know what each of these does. A muscle contracts, a gland secretes, another nerve stimulated. If that neurotransmitter acetylcholine isn't destroyed, it accumulates, it becomes in excess, and it continues to stimulate the muscle, which continues to contract, the gland continues to secrete, and the nerve continues to stimulate another nerve. So there's hyperactivity in all of those organs, and the cholinergic nervous system innervates a whole lot of things. Excess, acetylcholine, excess acetylcholine, continuous contraction of nerves, and this includes both the skeletal muscles, those that we voluntarily, voluntarily move, but also muscles that are internal. What are large groups of muscles internal? Smooth muscles. GI tract, that's one. Where's the other? Where? No, the diaphragm is kind of a skeletal muscle more than the bronchioles, the whole airway system. Arterioles, but that isn't of major significance in this particular sequence. So we have the airways and the gut are the two major things that are most clinically affected by too much acetylcholine. Secretions from glands. What extra can glands can we be talking about here? Salivary, where else? Eye. Lacrimal, right? Tear glands. Where else? Bronchioles. Good. Where else? Sweat. Where else? Got two more to go. Gastrointestinal tract has glands, and what else? Now, you guess the eyes, you guess the mouth, but you left out something in between. Does your nose ever run? The glands in the nose secrete? Sure. <laughs> Eyes, nose, salivary, sweat, airways, and gastrointestinal tract. All of those have exocrine glands. All of them secrete too much with nerve agent poisoning. <clears throat> now, cholinergic nervous system can be broken into muscarinic sites and nicotinic sites because these can be stimulated by muscarine and these by nicotine. Muscarinic sites are the glands, the smooth muscle, and the cranial nerves, primarily the vagus. Now the importance of that is, is that the major antidote, which is what? Atropine blocks these effects to some degree. Give atropine, glands dry, smooth muscle relaxes, and so on. The nicotinic sites, are those can be stimulated by nicotine, but they're primarily skeletal muscle and ganglionic connections preganglionic fibers. Atropine has very little effect on these. And if you have somebody who's twitching a lot and salivating with bronchoconstriction, you give them atropine. Salivation will decrease, bronchoconstriction will relax, but they'll continue to twitch. You're going to have a laboratory exercise today. You're going to do just that. Give atropine to an animal that's been given a nerve agent. Be careful when you handle that agent. And you're going to see just that. Their lungs will clear, their secretions will dry, but they'll continue to twitch. Okay, a reminder, skeletal muscle, 
smooth muscle, primarily airways and GI tract glands and other nerves, ganglionic connections. Muscarinic effects, most important contraction of smooth muscles are the airways. Then we have the gut. We also have the iris, which is not on here. Stimulation of glands, airway, or stimulation of yeah, glands, airways, GI, sweat, eye, nose, and mouth. And it stimulates the vagus to cause a slowing of the heart rate. Skeletal muscles, the first effect is fasciculations. You all know what fasciculations are? Little twitchings of muscle fibers. Look like ripples under the skin or worms under the skin. Very localized, usually, although generalized fasciculations are very characteristic of severe nerve agent poisoning and one of the last effects to go away. Twitching, flailing about of large muscle groups. Finally, muscles get fatigued and tired and they become flaccid, paralyzed. Stimulation of autonomic ganglia, preganglionic nerves to cause autonomic stimulation of the heart, tachycardia, and hypertension. So we have bradycardia of one mechanism and tachycardia another. Central nervous system. Sudden exposure to a large amount of agent will cause loss of consciousness within seconds. That's followed within a minute or two by convulsions. And depending on whether or not the individual is on pyridostigmine, <coughs> those convulsions may or may not stop within a few minutes. People not on pyridostigmine, their convulsive activity will stop in three to five minutes. Why? Do you want to guess? They're dead. That's one reason. Yeah. And no more acetylcholine, no, there's plenty of acetylcholine. Muscle fatigue and paralysis. Do you convulse when you're paralyzed? No, you might have seizure activity in the brain, but you don't convulse. What's another reason? Apnea. They stop breathing in about five minutes or seven minutes. <clears throat> Do you convulse when you're not breathing? Not too well. Two factors stop convulsive activity. <coughs> now, someone who's taken pyridostigmine does not stop breathing. And they will continue to live and to seize for a long period of time. And as Dr. Newmark is going to tell you, they may go on to have brain damage. From prolonged seizure activity. But without pyridostigmine, that doesn't happen. They'll go on to die very quickly unless there's intervention. <clears throat> right there, seizure activity, apnea, flaccid paralysis, and death. Another type of CNS effects can occur in anyone exposed to any amount of nerve agent, large amount, small amount, tiny amount, they may have a prolonged uh, set of, of psychological effects, forgetfulness, inability to think clearly, ir irritability, <laughs> sleep disturbances, slowed thinking, etc., etc. These have always gone away in a month to six weeks. There's a case report in your red book of a patient like this that we followed. Actually, we were able to reverse this with scopolamine. Oral scopolamine turned his thinking around and made him much better, which is interesting because now they've found that scopolamine is a very good anti-convulsant for nerve agent convulsions. But it makes sense. It's a cholinergic antagonist. Heart rate may go down, it may go up, so the heart rate is of no value in making a diagnosis. Death is a respiratory death, 
from peripheral factors such as bronchoconstriction and secretions in the bronchi, muscular weakness, no pump to move air, and depression in the brain, which is probably the biggest factor. Effects on the organs. Most common effect of vapor exposure is meiosis. And this generally is in both eyes, although once in a while it's in one eye. This is accompanied by red eyes or conjunctivitis, tearing. Patient will tell you his vision is dim, small pupil, but also interference in cholinergic pathways. Blurred vision, occasionally. Headache, pain around the eye, pain in the eye, and nausea and vomiting. The Japanese had a significant number of people who were exposed to vapor, well, all were exposed to vapor alone, had a significant number of nausea and vomiting, and they assumed that that meant that they'd had a severe exposure with systemic effects of nausea and vomiting. And that probably wasn't so. They probably would have relieved that nausea and vomiting if they'd put atropine or home atropine eye drops in. It's a reflex action through the vagus. I can't explain it all to you, but it does happen. So nausea and vomiting may be the result of meiosis. Runny nose, salivation, bronchoconstriction, bronchosecretions, complaints of tight chest, difficulty breathing, may be relatively mild, might be very severe. Gastrointestinal tract, secretions, muscular stimulation with vomiting, diarrhea, cramps, and belly aches. We've all had this, right? Anybody who hasn't, we all know what that's like. Skeletal muscles, again, fasciculations, twitching of large muscle groups, finally weakness and paralysis. Central nervous system, large sudden exposure, loss of consciousness, seizures, and then flaccid paralysis and apnea followed by death. Psychologic effects after any exposure to nerve agent, any amount. Now we're going to talk about vapor exposure and liquid exposure, and the first effects are not the same. The early signs and symptoms. Vapor effects come on within seconds to minutes of exposure. You've all been exposed to CS, right? Anybody had not been exposed to CS? Nobody's going to admit it. You realize how fast the effects occur, right? Within a minute or two, or within seconds after you are exposed. Same with nerve agents. Onset, very fast. Onset doesn't start 10 minutes after exposure. Somebody comes to you in a medical facility and said, I was exposed to GB 15 minutes ago. They have no signs of exposure. They're clear. Nothing's going to happen to them unless they've also been exposed to liquid. After low concentrations, eyes, nose, and airways, probably in that order, in Tokyo, 95% of their casualties had meiosis. In a study we did here that's in your book, about the same number had meiosis. Nose and airways, and after high concentration, the first effect in the central nervous system. The initial effects depend on the amount of exposure, small exposure. The response is local. These effects on the eyes, the nose, and the airway are a direct effect of the agent on the organ. You do not have to invoke the fact that the agent was absorbed systemically and then came back to cause the effects. Direct effect. And since this does not require agent absorption, there's very poor correlation with the cholinesterase in the red cell. This may be normal. This may be close to zero. And there's, this, again, a study in your textbook showing this. And it can be anywhere. No correlation. Large exposure, loss of consciousness, secretions, twitching, so on, death within five or ten minutes. And in this case, these are systemic effects 
And there is a good correlation with the red cell cholinesterase, which is always under 20 to 25 percent of the normal value. Big inhibition. Let me tell you another story. Again, a true story. Many years ago, we were conducting open air testing of nerve agents. And on this particular day, they were spraying GB from a spray tank from an airplane. Something happened to the spray tank. They had to drop it, so they jettisoned it, landed in the middle of a military installation, and it went plop, and there's a big puddle of GB out there, 100 gallons of it. So they landed the airplane, they thought, well, we better do something about this, so they went to the post commander and said, sir, we, we had a little problem out there and you've got 100 gallons of GB out on the South 40. What should we do about it? Well, now the post commander was post commander, high-ranking government officials. And what do high-ranking government officials do when they have a problem? Think about it. Cover it up. What? Huh? Consult their aides. Bury it. Come on, you guys are being cynical here, aren't you? <laughs> Come on. You know what high-ranking government officials do when they have a problem? Send them to the Pentagon. Appoint a special prosecutor, right? <laughs> he appointed a committee to investigate. Okay, so we have the safety, he pointed the safety officer and he got a bunch of his people. They thought, well, we're going out there, there's GB out there, it's a warm day, it's volatile, and da 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 da, maybe we better take the doctor with us. So they got the post surgeon, he got a couple of his medics, they all went out. They parked up when? A couple hundred yards. Got out of their vehicle. Safety officer said, well, that stuff's volatile, there's vapor. And even though we're upwind, you know, the wind might change or whatever. So let's put our mask on before we get close to it. Now they weren't concerned about full body protection, right? Why? Because they figured they were going to be dealing only with vapor and it takes an awful lot of vapor, five or ten times the lethal amount of vapor to do anything to bare skin. Don't need to worry about your skin when you're in nerve agent vapor. So everybody put their mask on but one person. Who do you think refused to mask? Doctor. Are all you people nurses? <laughs> all, I, all I heard was the doctor. Come on. <laughs> you mean to tell me you don't think the doctor would do what he was told to do? <laughs> nope. Well, the person that refused to put his mask on was the doctor. <laughs> And he was kind of a macho guy anyway. <laughs> he said, I want to be the first one to see that puddle. Went marching down there. He was seen 10 feet away from the puddle. He was seen to turn, clutch his chest, and fall over. A minute or two later, he started convulsing. And about four minutes later, he stopped convulsing. Now, why did he stop convulsing? Apnea. What'd you say? He was fried? <laughs> Paralysis and apnea. Now, he still may have had seizures, but he did not have motor movement. Well, his aidman had been well trained. They managed with great difficulty to save his life. But I tell you that story for a couple reasons. One, that guy was walking down there, turned around, fell over. From 100% to 0% within a couple seconds. Now, if he had his Mark Ones in his pocket, could he have helped himself? No. Absolutely not. He couldn't have found them. He couldn't even think about them. Completely gone that quickly after vapor. Effects again with, begin within seconds, maximize within a couple minutes. They're not going to get worse. 
a long time later. They're not delayed in onset. And the other thing is they may actually improve if they're not too severe. We used to have an aid station here, and we used to see a lot of people come in. In fact, as you're going to see the eyes of one of them in a minute. This guy came in. He said, all of a sudden, it was like I put sunglasses on. Everything got dim. He said, my nose started running, and I started having a lot of trouble breathing. But now, Doc, here it is 15, 20 minutes later. I'm in your aid station. My breathing's much better. fact is, it's almost back to normal. He didn't receive any antidote. He hadn't received any. We didn't give him any. The only thing really wrong was his vision was dim. Okay, vapor exposure, local effects, eye effects, meiosis, injection, nose effects, rhinorrhea, airway effects, and then systemic effects. And the nausea and vomiting probably should go up there under local effects because they're caused by the meiosis. Muscular hyperactivity, weakness, convulsions, depression of the CNS, apnea, death. This is our experience with some of the people we've seen with small vapor exposure, 59 to 62 had meiosis. Very characteristic. Okay, what was this guy exposed to? Atropine? Is that what someone said? Okay, could be. Is that what atropine would do to a normal person? How about somebody had had meiosis from nerve agent and you gave them a Mark I with atropine? Would it do that? Everybody say no. A Mark I with atropine or atropine in the arm, in the vein, will not reverse nerve agent caused meiosis. You have to put it in the eye. And when you put atropine in the eye, what does it cause? Big pupils, but what else? Blurred vision for about 24 hours. So you don't want to treat everybody that has meiosis. They'll do well with meiosis. They have trouble in dim vision or with dim light, but they can see pretty well. And you put atropine in, you're going to blur them. The only indications for putting atropine in the eye are severe pain in the eye or head and nausea and vomiting. This guy wasn't exposed to atropine. He's something exposed, exposed to something each of you is exposed to within 24 hours. Darkness. He sat in the dark for five minutes. What happens when you sit in the dark for five minutes? Pupils get big, right? Sure. This guy sat in the dark for five minutes. His pupils didn't get big. Why? He'd been exposed to nerve agent the day before. I said he walked in, dim vision, trouble seeing. He didn't have any pain, didn't have any nausea and vomiting. His breathing was okay by the time he got there. It had improved a little bit. Runny nose was no, no factor. So we took his picture. Now, that's what you do when you don't treat them, you know, take their picture. Anyway, that's the same guy. How long do you think it was between those two pictures? Between no response to darkness and full response to darkness? It was about 60 days. Skin exposure, now keep in mind the size of that lethal droplet that you saw, right? Remember that size of that. First effects of exposure to a droplet on the skin are localized. They are sweating and maybe fasciculations at the site. And these may be the only effects if the droplet is very small, 1 20th of the size of that droplet you saw. And that's, those are local effects. Get a little bigger, one-tenth of that droplet, or maybe one-fifth of that droplet. Start getting systemic effects. The agent gets absorbed. It causes gastrointestinal effects, vomiting, nausea, diarrhea. And the blood cholinesterase inhibition is below 30%. Again, there's a table in the textbook pointing this out. Onset of these effects 
up to 18 hours after exposure. So if you have a casualty who may have been exposed to liquid, you have to watch him for 18 hours because he may get sick. These may occur even after decontamination. And I'll tell you a story about that in a minute. Full droplet or bigger, onset within 30 minutes, first effect, loss of consciousness, convulsions, apnea. There once was a chemist here at Edgewood, in fact, as he may still be here, who one day was pipetting a dilute solution of Soman. You all know how to pipette, right? You hold it in a bulb or have a pipette dropper-like device. You all know how to do that. Not too many agreeable faces out there. Anyway, he was doing it the old-fashioned way. Dilute Soman. He did a little too much sucking. First thing you know, he had some in his mouth and on his cheek. Now, he did exactly what he was taught to do, and he did exactly the right thing, which was decon. He ran immediately to the fountain, which was an eye wash actually, I think, stuck his face in it, rinsed his mouth out, continued flushing for five or ten minutes. Within 30 seconds of exposure, he had done that, started that. You can't do it much faster. He then got a friend to drive him up to our aid station. He walked in the aid station. He was standing there talking to us. And we were standing there pulling up atropine into, into syringes and hanging up some 2-PAM chloride while he was talking, perfectly normal, and suddenly, in mid-sentence, he collapsed. Started twitching and started gasping for air. Two points. Number one, onset of effects was sudden. No preliminary things. He didn't say, oh, I'm starting to feel sick to my stomach or, you know, I'm starting to salivate too much. Nothing preliminary. Straight to zero percent function. Second point, he had deconned as fast as he could, almost as fast as humanly possible. And he still had very severe effects. Now, if he hadn't deconned, he probably would not have made it out of his laboratory. He probably had such an amount that he probably would have died before he could have gone anywhere. So decontamination diminished his illness, but it did not prevent it. And that's an important point. You decon to get rid of the agent, yes, but you're not going to prevent all of its effects. Well, in some circumstances you might, but generally, no. Exposure to an LD50 or better, which he probably had, first effect, loss of consciousness, seizure activity, it's going to occur within minutes, and the acetylcholinesterase activity in the red cell is going to be close to zero, which this guy's was. Skin exposure, increased muscle activity, Localized sweating, systemic effects, GI first, skeletal muscle, breathing, and finally, central nervous system. These might be the first ones, and usually are after a large exposure. Now, management of nerve agent casualty, in no particular order, decontamination, ventilate, Block the excess acetylcholine, remove the agent from the enzyme, and some other things. In treating any kind of chemical casualty, what's the most important thing for you to do? Rule one, and don't ever forget this, rule one, protect yourself. You know, in the Iran-Iraq war, Iran sent some casualties out of the country for medical care, mostly to Europe. They weren't too careful in how they decon them, and these were mustard casualties, not nerve agent. 
Sometimes they didn't remove all their clothing, such as their underwear, and they sent these patients partially contaminated to other countries. Whereupon, the people on the airplanes, and these were commercial planes, and people in receiving hospitals allegedly got contaminated from cross-contamination from these people. They did not protect themselves. A couple of these casualties, five as a matter of fact, were sent here to the States, and several of the physicians here and I got to visit and see them at the time. A man, a woman, and, f and three children, even though they were from different families. Protecting yourself, common sense, right? Not always common sense. Common sense is not always common. But even dumb animals know to protect themselves. Basic instinct. Several weeks ago, I was rummaging around in a closet at home where I keep things like ammonia and Clorox and Drano and all that stuff we all keep around, kind of toxic. My dog came in the room, came to the door, saw what I was doing, immediately turned and ran away. She recognized the hazard. A few minutes later, my dog came back. <laughs> Trying to tell me she had more sense than I did. <laughs> you protect yourself by wearing appropriate apparel or by ensuring that the casualty has been thoroughly decontaminated. Two ways to do it. Ventilation. Well, when you use pyridostigmine, in primates at least, they don't stop breathing despite large doses of agent, despite large doses of soman have to be specific on that. They don't stop breathing, so you don't need to ventilate if that applies to humans. But sometimes casualties do stop breathing. And what do you do for them? Out on a battlefield, what can you do for them? Nothing. What can you do for them in a battalion aid station? Well, you, what do you have? Two or three ambu bags and maybe one ventilator? So that's not much help. But whatever you have, Keep in mind, the airway resistance is extremely high. If you put a tube in these people and try to bag breathe them, you won't until they have atropine. I've tried to bag breathe somebody. I tried to mouth to mouth an animal, a dog. Well, don't sit there envisioning my, my mouth on a dog's <laughs> snout, actually. He had a, he, it had a tube in, endotracheal tube, and we'd given it a nerve agent and we tried to breathe it, just like breathing against that wall, just solid. So you have to give them atropine before you're going to do any good ventilating. And that kind of goes counter to the usual teaching. The first thing you do is ABCs. You have to make that AABC, antidote, airway, breathing, and circulation, because you can't breathe them until the atropine works a little bit. The best and quickest decon is physical removal. Now you're going to hear a lot about fancy equipment, decon kits, and everything off, everything else, but the plain thing is get the stuff off. What do you do when you spill something toxic on your arm at home? You run to the faucet, turn it on full blast, and flush it, right? Same thing with chemical agents. You know, hypochlorite, the M258A1, they all have nice chemicals, and those chemicals break down or decompose agents, but they don't do it immediately. It takes minutes. And you put Clorox on somebody and leave it on for 10 minutes, and I've heard this taught, the stay time of 10 minutes. What's that do? It gives the agent 10 more minutes to penetrate your skin, doesn't it? if it's not immediately broken down, which it isn't. So get it off, whatever you have. Okay, block the excess acetylcholine. The drug of choice is atropine. Atropine is chosen as a trade-off 40, 45 years ago because it's effective and its side effects. Now, a lot of anti-cholinergics or anticholinergic blocking drugs are effective. Some of them have too many side effects. BZ is an excellent antidote for nerve agents. 
but you don't want to give BZ to soldiers to carry around in injectors, do you? They might discover they can have fun with that. Although I've never really seen somebody who'd been exposed to BZ who wanted to do it again, quite honestly. But nonetheless, trade-off, it's effective, minimal side effects. What's potentially the most serious side effects effect from atropine? Come on, you know what atropine does. Tachycardia. Now, you're a young, healthy person, aren't you? You're in the military, so by definition, you're a young, healthy person. How much does an injection of atropine increase a heart rate of a resting person? by 35 beats a minute. Now, can you increase your heart rate by 35 beats a minute without any adverse effects? Absolutely. Fact is, you'd hardly know it if your heart rate went up 35 beats. So that's not the answer. Good answer, but wrong. What else does atropine do? Huh? Stop sweating, and what does that do? Heat. If it's a warm day and if there's work or exertion and you've taken atropine, you can get in a lot of trouble. Some years ago, they sent 35 soldiers to march around this airstrip on an August day at 85 degrees and 85% humidity. They did it. They were all hot and sweaty. They were unhappy, but their core temperatures were below 100. A couple of days later, they gave them two milligrams of atropine. They did that again, and fewer than half of them finished it. Core temperatures above 103 and a half. So that's what atropine will do. Atropine blocks the effects at the muscarinic sites, it dries secretions, it reduces smooth muscle contractions, including the airways, does not do anything to skeletal muscles, and does not do anything to meiosis unless you put it in the eye by means of eye drops. Starting dose is 2 milligrams. Usual total dose is no more than 20 milligrams. Don't interpret this as saying you can't give more than 20. But that's the most that's, that's been given. Now, with pesticides, much larger doses are required, 100, 500, or 1,000 milligrams a day <coughs> for pesticides. So nerve agents require significantly less atropine. Give atropine at five to 10 minute intervals until secretions are drying, look in the mouth, and until the airways are better. Somebody's conscious, he'll certainly tell you, hey doc, I'm breathing a lot better now. Or if they're unconscious, you can tell by how much resistance there is to ventilation. Those are the two criteria for stopping atrophy. Oxemes remove the nerve agent from the cholinesterase. Remember the basic problem is the uh, agent attaches to this enzyme acetylcholinesterase. In the absence of aging, aging is a process by which the agent becomes irreversibly attached to the enzyme and an oxime cannot remove it. It's refractory reactivation by the oxime. This is the nerve agent. These are the active sites on cholinesterase. The oxime comes along, picks it off, lifts it up. The enzyme is back to normal, can function, and the nerve agent gets detoxified. Very simple, except because of that large glob on GD or SOMAN that I pointed out to you. This becomes irreversibly attached, and the nerve agent or the oxime cannot get in there to pull it off. That happens in two minutes with SOMAN. Now it happens with other agents too, but the time time is much longer. For example, with sarin, it's three to four hours. Oxemes have no muscarinic effects. They help at nicotinic sites, they improve the smooth muscles, skeletal muscles. We have 2-PAM chloride or pradoxime or protopam. Other countries have other oxemes. The dose IV is about one gram given in 20 to 30 minutes. If you give it faster than that, the blood pressure is going to go up to 250. And that can be quickly reduced with phentolamine. 
Seizures are brief in the absence of pyridostigmine because they're stopped primarily by death or intervention. With pyridostigmine, they're prolonged and may lead to permanent damage. Cardiac effects, there are some brief arrhythmias. The most serious one is one that's caused by intravenous atropine given to somebody who's hypoxic. This will produce ventricular fibrillation. So don't give atropine intravenously until you ventilate it casually. Recovery usually occurs in a couple hours. By recovery, I mean they start gaining consciousness. They start breathing spontaneously. And in all cases, except where there is irreversible brain damage, like that young lady in Tokyo, this has happened within a couple hours. It may not feel good for a couple days. Return to duty. They will have a visual problem, of dim vision for a couple weeks, and they may have psychological problems. And these can be extremely subtle. If you have an individual who's been exposed to nerve agents, even a very small amount, and want to return him to duty, and his duty is an air traffic controller, you better do a very careful mental status exam on him. Long term, no real known long term effects. There's a study done a number of years ago in which they took a group of people who had been exposed to sarin, group of controls, they did EEGs on them. They couldn't tell the difference on individual records. Somebody read all the records, couldn't pick out which one had been exposed. When they averaged the groups, they could tell a slight difference between the averages, not individuals. Rule two, what was rule one? Good, rule two. In the presence of loss of consciousness and or severe signs in two or more systems, that is airway, CNS, gastrointestinal, or skeletal muscle, give three Mark ones and diazepam immediately. Don't question it, do it. Rule three, when it casually requires three Mark ones at one time, always give diazepam. Now let's talk about a couple cases, what we would do about it, and then we're gonna demonstrate the Mark one. Small vapor exposure, somebody who has meiosis and rhinorrhea and walks into your clinic, what do you do for them? Observe. Do they need any therapy? No, not unless they have pain in the eye or unless they have nausea and vomiting. Then you put what? What do you do in that case? Atropine or home atropine eye drops. IM or IV atropine will not help meiosis. If they're short of breath, what do you do for them? Mark one. One or two. If they're mild to moderately short of breath, one. If they're real severely short of breath, maybe two. But atropine's a wonderful drug. It does wonderful things, as you will see with your own eyes this afternoon. So you can almost always start with one and then wait a few minutes before giving a second. A severe exposure, unconscious, seizures, apnea, airway problems, GI problems, or moderate to severe symptoms in two or more systems. As problems in GI tract, airway, skeletal muscle, or CNS, three Mark ones immediately with diazepam. Small liquid exposure with localized fasciculations and sweating, one mark one, because the stuff has gotten into the skin. It's past the epithelial barrier. Vomiting and diarrhea, definite systemic effects requiring a mark one. And a severe liquid exposure, loss of consciousness, seizures, disturbances in two or more systems, three Mark I's and diazepam. Now this is just a starting dose. This individual is undoubtedly going to need more, but as a start.
I'm going to follow up what Dr. Seidel has presented to you partly by way of review and partly by way of introducing pretreatment to which he's already alluded. We can treat nerve agent poisoning. We have to treat it very quickly. The reason why you need, before you leave here, to know something about these things is that you don't have the time you had with the bioagents that you heard about earlier in the week. You probably realize now there's not a single bioagent that acts really fast. SEB, maybe uh, you get a big slug, maybe four or five, six hours. But if you get an anthrax casualty and you make the diagnosis and you're starting to think about, oh, gee, you know, do I want to treat all these other people? I have lots of time. I can look that up in the book. In the case of a nerve agent casualty, as I think you now realize, the kinetics are such that you don't have the time to do that. In fact, as Dr. Seidel mentioned to you, if you have a nerve agent casualty in front of you, and you've got two hands and nobody around you, and one hand has a ventilator and the other hand has a Mark I, which one goes in first? Mark I. The Mark I, because I can't even get, uh, unless I'm Charles Atlas, I'm probably not gonna be able to ventilate that patient very well because of the airway collapse. So by means of segueing into talking about pretreatment, let me pretend for the moment that this is a neurology class, or no, that, that wouldn't work at all. Let me pretend for the moment that you guys are preparing for boards and you've called me as the neurologist to remember some of the physiology of diseases you already know. Well, you just heard all about botulinum toxin poisoning. Okay, you should understand the physiology of botulinum toxin poisoning. What happens in Botox poisoning? Where does it act? You get paralysis, but I'm going to be more specific. Where does botulinum toxin act? It acts presynaptically, so I can't release acetylcholine. For the moment, let's just talk about neuromuscular transmission, so we're only talking about cholinergic transmission for the moment. So what kind of weakness does a botulinum toxin casualty develop? Flaxid, Flaxid exactly. The, the muscle simply cannot contract. Now let me remind you about another disease that we haven't talked about this week at all, but it is of some relevance, and that's the disease near and dear to my heart because I get paid to take care of it. it exactly, myasthenia gravis. What's wrong with people in myasthenia gravis? Anybody remember? Say, again. You develop antibodies against the receptor on the postsynaptic side, and so acetylcholine is normally released, but it doesn't have enough receptors to interact with, and therefore you get a similar kind of weakness, although it's usually more acute than in botulinum toxin. Again, the muscle just can't contract normally. Hold that thought. How do we treat myasthenia gravis? We prolong the length of time that acetylcholine is present. And the way we do that is by giving an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. Well, Dr. Seidel has now exposed you, a terrible word for this context, he has exposed you to the two categories of acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. They are the carbamates and the organophosphates. And the major difference for the moment between those two is that carbamates are relatively reversible inhibitors whereas organophosphates are relatively irreversible inhibitors, but they basically work on the same action. So I can take a carbamate, and the one that we use for diagnosis in myasthenia is physostigmine, that's our little tensilon test. The one we use for treatment is pyridostigmine, and that will prolong the action of acetylcholine. Any of you who treated myasthenics, you know that you can't just give a dose of pyridostigmine. How long does it last? How often do we give it? We give it usually TID because it tends to wear off, and that's going to come in here and again. Now let's go back to nerve agents. How do nerve agents work? What's the, the location at which the nerve agent works? It works directly on the enzyme, okay? It is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, and so we have so much acetylcholine around that we have an overstimulation. In fact, what nerve agents do is to convert acetylcholine from a neurotransmitter into a poison. That's what they do. You're basically poisoning somebody with his own acetylcholine. And so what is the effect of that on muscle? It's overstimulation. Remember you saw that cat in the video. The cat was overstimulated and eventually became paralyzed, but only because all the juice had run out of the muscle. Now, this is for the AMED Center in school. The purpose of the next little presentation is to explain why we would want to pretreat for nerve agent poisoning. Now, Dr. Seidel's already alluded to this. There's a side reaction that occurs. Once I have formed 
the complex of a nerve agent with acetylcholinesterase, the agent enzyme complex. Over a period of time, a side reaction occurs, which I personally think is a real misnomer. That's that aging reaction, which Dr. Seidel referred to. I don't like that term, but we're stuck with it. It's an old term. We're not going to change it. And what aging actually is, is the liberation of an extra side group. But what aging basically does is it converts that complex into one which oxime, from one which oxime can hydrolyze into one which oxime can't hydrolyze. So it converts this complex into something I, from something that I could treat with my Mark I to something that I can't. And the rate at which that occurs is predictable. And as Dr. Seidel mentioned, for sarin and tablin, you have several hours in which to do that. Well, in the case of sarin and tablin, similar to the Tokyo subway victims, does it matter that it takes a couple of hours? Do I care about that reaction? If I've gotten a lethal dose, I don't care at all because I'm going to die of the dose, okay? The patient's going to be alive or dead in that two or three hours. And in the case of uh, GA, I think it's even longer. In the case of GD, the average length is two minutes. And the chance that I'm going to get to that victim, whether it's in a Tokyo subway or on a battlefield, within two minutes is relatively small. And so back quite a long time before the Gulf War, this problem was recognized. How are we going to protect our troops against GD? Our oxime won't work. And that's where pretreatment came along. Therapy for SOMAN is relatively ineffective because of this aging side reaction, which we know is going to take place very quickly. By the way, Iraq had a lot of SOMAN. Still does. Now, what carbamates do is to bind to acetylcholinesterase. And you would say, why in the world would that be helpful? After all, that's what nerve agents do. Carbamates, in fact, in high doses, produce exactly the same <coughs> cholinergic excess that nerve agents produce. What in the world is the value of this? Well, after I've been exposed to nerve agent, the answer is there's no value at all. And that's an important teaching point. Treating somebody with carbamate, once they've gotten a dose of nerve agent, is absolutely useless because I'm just going to be potentiating that effect. I'm going to make them worse, not better. But the difference is that the carbamates, and the one that has been chosen is pyridostigmine, they form a complex which spontaneously dissociates. Let me give you an analogy. Dr. Madsen is not all that, that fond of this analogy, but I'll give you an idea. If I take my bank of acetylcholinesterase and I bind it up with nerve agent, I have invested in a stock that's going downhill. I can't get my money back out of that bank. That bank is going bankrupt. And all I can do, if I'm very lucky, I can pry it open with the 2-PAM crowbar, as Colonel Adson sometimes <laughs> refers to it, which is sort of like the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, maybe liberate a little bit of it before it ages. Now, if I instead invest some of that money in carbamate, pyridostigmine being the one that we have chosen, what I'm doing is I'm essentially safeguarding it. I'm hiding it. Because I know that although I won't have access to it for a period of time, it will be coming back online at a very predictable rate. Now, if I am not in any danger of having a big assault from nerve agent, then that doesn't really do me much good. But it probably won't do me much harm either, and I'll show you why. But if I know that I'm going to be getting a hit with a nerve agent, I can protect some of my native enzymes. I know that I'll be getting it back at a predictable rate. And this is the rationale for pretreatment. Now you see why it's called pretreatment. It is not a treatment. Neither it is it an immunization. It is a pretreatment. And it turns out I don't have to use up a great deal of my acetylcholinesterase in this pyridostigmine or carbamate enzyme complex in order to really increase my ability to survive a nerve agent challenge. That's the theory. These are Colonel Madsen's, okay? Pac-Man is the good stuff. Pac-Man is acetylcholinesterase. That's what you want. It happens to be membrane-bound to the postsynaptic membrane, but we won't even deal with that here. And pyridostigmine attaches to it. Isn't that? This is very high-tech. And on the right, you see the small blue diamonds are nerve agent. Nerve agent also attaches 
And if the nerve agent happens to be flavored soman, it gets sewed up. That's a nice little way of remembering it. It gets sewed and attached, and my 2-pam chloride or whatever oxium I have around isn't going to be able to liberate it. But the stuff that I have concealed by my temporary binding to pyridostigmine, the carbon made of choice, that's available. Well, that's all very nice. That's all theory. And you know perfectly well there's a lot in biology that we don't necessarily see in the living organism that really works well in the test tube. But this is at least the theory. Now, have we ever tested this in people and exposed them to a nerve agent challenge? No, we haven't. But we certainly have done it in animals. And this is the, you are about to go over to the building where this work was carried out, and you will be seeing the intellectual descendants of the monkeys who were used for this. They are rhesus monkeys. It's the same experimental system. And what the, the experimental design was, was that you take monkeys, you expose them to an LD50 of Soman. Then you have another group, and you expose them to an LD50 of Soman, and you give them all the atropine and 2-pam chloride that looks clinically valuable. And you can increase the amount that the LD50 now equates to by a factor of 60%. In other words, 1.6 times as much Soman on average is required to kill the monkey if I'm sitting there giving all of my treatments. If I give the pretreatment with pyridostigmine and I conceal some of my acetylcholinesterase from the nasty nerve agent, I can increase the LD50 40 times. Put it another way, I can survive 40 times as much. Put it another way, I can protect against 40 lethal doses on average. So that's the take home message. I need a lot more Soman to kill me once I have been pretreated. Now, is there any value to this in sarin? Not really, because sarin is something which ages very slowly. And the same thing is true for the nerve agent VX. Tactically, the three nerve agents with which we are most concerned, based on our intelligence estimates, are sarin GB, soman GD, and VX. Now, am I going to know which agent is going to be put down against me? No, I'm not. And in the case of the Iraqis, we know that Soman was an agent of tremendous interest. In the case of the North Koreans, it turns out to be mostly VX, but we never are going to know. Now, how safe is pyridostigmine? How many people here have ever given it? Not very many. I'm surprised. But then again, I'm a neurologist, so what do I know? You know to me, everybody's got nerve disease. Uh, pyridostigmine has been out there. It is manufactured by Hoffman LaRoche as Mestinon. It's been on the United States Pharmacopeia since sometime in the 1940s. Okay? Therefore, it's, we have a lot of clinical experience with it in myasthenic patients, and we know a lot about its side effect profile. Can you imagine what the side effects might be? Just hazard a guess. What might I do? If I give somebody something that ties up a certain percentage of their acetylcholinesterase, the side effects are going to be the side effects of too much acetylcholine. So what are those? Smooth muscle. Smooth muscle contraction. So I have GI side effects, which turns out to be the one that most people report. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Diarrhea is actually the most common, I think. And then you can also have rhinorrhea. You can have all the signs and symptoms of nerve agent poisoning, just relatively mild. How often do we run into that? Well, I'm the only neurologist here, so you're going to have to take my clinical experience for it, but I've treated a lot of patients with pyridostigmine. And the fact of the matter is most of them have very, very little if they really need it. Uh, yes, if you push it high enough, they'll all get this. But the safety of this drug, this is not an experimental drug, guys. This has been out there for a very long time. We all feel very comfortable with it. And we give it generally TID. Some of my myasthenics need it more. Why do they have to take it more than once a day? You should understand that now. The dissociation is a regular one. Once I take a dose of pyridostigmine, whether it's the large slug I give to the myasthenic or the relatively smaller slug that I'm giving as pretreatment to a healthy soldier humping around in the desert, after a certain number of hours, that complex will dissociate. And so if I want to keep a high level or an effective level, I have to give it several times a day. The average turns out to be TID. 
And that turns out to be the dosage schedule that the military recommends and uses for nerve agent pretreatment. In terms of, um, well, we've already mentioned that this was shown in animal studies. Now remember, those animal studies were not the same as taking a person and giving them nerve agent. That may be something of importance from the point of view of regulation. We have at the FDA in this country, they do, as a general rule, a superlative job, probably the best of any country in the world. The FDA routinely requires proof of safety and efficacy in humans. Do we have proof of efficacy of pyridostigmine against myasthenia gravis in humans? Yes. yes, lots of it. Do we have proof of efficacy of pyridostigmine for nerve agent pretreatment in humans? If it exists, we don't have it, it's probably sitting there in some Nazi or Iraqi or North Korean laboratory, but we don't have access to that, and ethically, we cannot create that data for the FDA. Now, what we see in terms of side effects is based upon our experience in the Gulf War when this actually was used. How many people took pyridostigmine in the Gulf War? Not very many, I'm relatively surprised. It was the people in this room who really took the lead on this. Dr. Seidel was running all over the theater teaching people how to use this stuff. Lieutenant Colonel Keeler, who was one of our predecessors, was called the Pill Lady. She was all over Saudi Arabia. And Dr. Seidel, Dr. Keeler, Dr. Dunn, Colonel Dunn, who was at the time the uh, commander here, uh, tried to pool the experience of people in the United States forces after the Gulf War to find out how well this was tolerated. The feeling was there was no decrement in military tasks. In fact, it turns out you can bind up about 30% of your acetylcholinesterase and you'll have no clinical observable defect in a young, healthy military population. That's the population which was done. Side effects were seen, now this is reported by the medical officers, PAs, battalion aid station level, and so forth, less than 5%. Um, there are some long-term issues with pyridostigmine, and they have to do, again, with having so much of your enzyme bound up that you can't uh, regenerate it quite as fast. But they're the same side effects you've always seen, and this is not really an issue for pretreatment, because pretreatment is envisioned, and it was used this way in the Gulf War, as something that you use for a very restricted period of time when you think tactically that you're under a real threat of a nerve agent attack. You do not put your troops on this the minute they come into theater, keep it there for 179 days and take it off. The way the military envisions pretreatment and the way that they used it in the Gulf War was as a command decision based on the tactical situation. You take your troops off it because they will have some side effects, mostly GI. Um, the dose is interesting. Does anybody know what the myasthenic dose is? Average starting myasthenic dose. Once I diagnose myasthenia in my patient, I say you need mestinon, I put you on. How much? Okay, we can use Dr. Urbanetti's. 30 milligrams, 60 milligrams, 120 milligrams. Multiple choice. 30. 30. Wrong. Turns out to be 60. The FDA approved starting dose for myasthenia, for pyridostigmine, is 60 milligrams TID. Based on animal studies, and some of the people who did that, or their successors in the back of the room, they'll correct me if I'm wrong, Major Golden, Lieutenant Colonel Meyer, it was decided that we don't need that much. And therefore, we have even less side effects to worry about. The military dose for pretreatment for nerve agent attack was 30 milligrams TID. Hold that thought because unfortunately, the FDA has approved this for myasthenia at a higher dose. Now, the command makes the decision. That's what our doctrine states. Reganol is the other brand name of pyridostigmine used not too often anymore for anesthesia. And I must tell you, if you really want to know about its use in anesthesia, I ask you to wait till tomorrow when Lieutenant Colonel Baxter comes back because he's the nurse anesthetist and he knows all about that. I don't put people to sleep. I just, you know, admire their disease, right? So I admire their disease with mestinon rather than with reganol. But it's the same stuff. It's pyridostigmine, okay? Now, pyridostigmine is bioavailable, 8 to 29 percent, but that turns out to be enough fine. Goes out in about three and a half hours. And the enzyme will dissociate in about the same time. So that's why we need TID dosing. Now, here is the Gulf War data. 
which was compiled largely by Dr. Seidel and colleagues. And if you want to see all of his reports on this, just take a look in the uh, big textbook, to, uh, Military Medicine, where his data is all repeated in detail. Yes, people had side effects. Almost all of them were GI. GU, they said 5 to 30 percent. Some people say possibly less. But only one-tenth of one percent of these people were reported by their medical officers to have been told to discontinue it for medical reasons. The vast majority of these people, essentially everybody was able to stay on it. Now, since this was reported by Dr. Seidel and his colleagues, there's been a study done by the, I think it was the Institute of Medicine or the VA, I forget which, which studied people retrospectively sort of sent out a questionnaire saying, what did you know about this? And it now appears that we did, as an army, as a navy, as an air force, a less than perfect job of explaining the rationale and explaining the pluses and minuses of this therapy to people. They claim that they thought it was experimental. They claim that their medic, their PA, and so forth did not explain it to them. That's a take-home point for all of you because every one of you is basically at risk of advising some tactical commander, some non-medical commander in one of the three services and explaining why we're using this stuff. If he doesn't understand it, he doesn't know when to order his troops to take it, and he sure isn't going to support you in going around and explaining to the troops. And compliance is probably something we will have to worry about. So that's a lesson learned. We hope that we've learned it from the Gulf War. But an important lesson that the slide does mention is that this stuff is very, very well tolerated. We had no serious problems that we know of directly attributed to periodosigmine. And actually, that's exactly what we would have expected because we're using a lot less than we use in myasthenic. We're using it for a much, much shorter period of time. Nobody in the Gulf War was on this for more than three or four weeks. Most of the time, it was on for shorter periods of time than that. So we would not have expected to have anything worse than we did see. Now, Dr. Seidel has alluded in detail to the questions of seizures. Because we didn't have periodosigmine years ago, we assumed that certain doses were just going to kill you. People were going to, as you'll hear tomorrow when Dr. Uh, Colonel Baxter talks about triage, they're going to self-triage. They're not going to present. They're going to be dead. With pyridostigmine, animal data, and there's a lot of it, and it comes from across the street and from other places, shows that the animals survive. They continue to breathe. They continue to live on. And they go into prolonged status epilepticus. It was because pyridostigmine was going to be used that the doctrine changed to the doctrine that you've just been taught by Dr. Seidel, and that is that when you, give, when you need three Mark I's, you either are seizing or you have a very high likelihood of seizing, and the seizure will not stop on its own with the death of the patient or with the hypoxia or whatever. And so you have to give the anticonvulsant. And the anticonvulsant of choice that we field is diazepam. Now, I can call it Valium because my father invented the stuff, but you have to call it diazepam. I was raised by Hoffman LaRoche. That's fine. That's just personal aside. You can call it diazepam. And that's where that piece of doctrine came from. Now, that completes all of the stuff that I wanted to talk about that's testable. But for the next five minutes, just for the fun of it, I thought I would explain to you a little bit more about how this stuff gets studied and what nerve agent seizures do to you. This is a friend of mine. A uh, friend is a guinea pig, and uh, he lives across the street. Um, he doesn't live all that long, I'm afraid. He has a relatively short life expectancy because Dr. McDonough has uh, equipped him with all sorts of things. He has everything he needs for a complete and, for, and, and happy life, although it is a short one. He has bedding, he has food, he has water, and he's actually very healthy. And he's had a surgical operation, and that surgical operation has implanted an EEG electrode that sits right on top of his dura. And so Dr. McDonough can do whatever he likes to this friend of mine, and we know whether that brain is seizing or not, whether or not the animal <coughs> is convulsing, because as Dr. Seidel has correctly pointed out to you, and as I know well from being a neurologist, you can have seizure activity and you may not see it, either because it's non-convulsive status or because the patient no longer has enough juice in the muscles to show you muscle movement. So Dr. McDonough and Dr. Tony Shi across the street study this with implantable dural electrodes. And from their work on nerve agents, usually the, the standard model is a pyridostigmine pretreated guinea pig exposed to nerve agent. 
they have learned a lot of very interesting things about the brains of animals that go into status epilepticus with these agents. Very interesting, particularly for those, anybody here work in an ICU? Dr. Peen I know and so forth. You know a lot about people who are brain dead. And you know a lot about people who have strokes and people who have ischemic uh, or anoxic encephalopathy. Turns out that status epileptic is caused by nerve agents is physiologically in some ways much closer to that than it is to status epilepticus that you routinely see. Your status epilepticus patient who usually comes in is usually somebody with pre-existing brain lesion, pre-existing seizure disorder, and they have a little area that fires too much or slows down too much in the brain, and then that sets up a discharge that travels all over the brain. And most of our anticonvulsants treat that patient by preventing the spread. That's how Dilantin works, Tegretol, all the anticonvulsants that you would routinely use. That is not the mechanism of seizure propagation in nerve agents. And you can think about it. Here we have a young, healthy trooper. Basically, we're not sending people onto the battlefield with epilepsy. We're sending them without epilepsy, generally speaking. At least I hope so. I don't want the guy, you know, keeping me uh, safe with his M16 to be seizing all the time. Um, there's profile issues. But anyway, they're not epileptic to begin with, and I suddenly turn on all of their cholinergic synapses, because that's what nerve agents do. Remember I told you, you take acetylcholine, you convert it from a neurotransmitter into a poison. So you poison all the synapses simultaneously. So stopping the spread isn't going to help. And we should have predicted exactly what Dr. McDonough has now convincingly shown, that most of the standard anticonvulsants don't work. Diazepam does work. In fact, all the benzodiazepines work. And I am here to tell you that one of the interesting issues that's <coughs> recently come up here in the Institute, and Dr. Hurst, Colonel Hurst and I are trying to take the lead on this, along with the people who are really doing the work across the street, is possibly to replace diazepam with a better benzodiazepine. But none of the other ones turned out to work. What actually does work is anticholinergics, which are not anticonvulsant in almost any other situation. But uh, the other interesting thing that comes out, and I'm mentioning it here because we really don't have any other time in the course to mention it, is for those of you who deal with ischemic brain, people who take care of stroke patients and so forth, if you allow these animals to go on and seize for 40 minutes or so, their brains look like stroke patient brains. They have apoptotic change. And they don't look anything like the uh, brains of people who routinely go into status epilepticus. In fact, they look a great deal worse, although it's regional. And so there's an interest in possibly protecting them. And one of the things that, Dr., that Colonel Little didn't mention in his briefing to the last class when he talks about research, so I don't expect he will this time, so I'm mentioning it to you now, we're thinking about is a neuroprotection initiative where we might add something to our field formulary where we can protect these very, very vulnerable neurons with the same sorts of drugs that are being worked on by drug companies for the kind of change that you see around a stroke in, in order to reduce the size of the ischemic penumbra. I would not be going into this if I didn't know that the vast majority of you are doctors and nurses. I don't talk about this stuff to the medics because it's really not stuff that they're ever going to see. But that's sort of a preview of coming attractions. So at any rate, the important things that I want you to get out of this 20 minutes or so are all the stuff that's in your book and none of the esoteric research <coughs> minutiae. The important thing is pyridostigmine is a, it is not a treatment for nerve agent poisoning. If I have a nerve agent casualty and I give him pyridostigmine, do I make him better or worse? worse? I make him worse, so I'm not going to be doing that. Nor are they immunizations. Now, the, that seems perhaps a little crazy. After you all, you've just come from you sam right up at Frederick, and you know exactly what an immunization is. I get a vaccine, I build up antibodies. And you say, well, why am I even mentioning that? The reason is that Colonel Little will tell you that we have a scavenger program, which in a sense is a chemical immunization against nerve agent, which is certainly not up to being fielded yet. But that may come. But this is not that either. This is taking an existing medication and hiding, concealing <laughs> some of our target enzyme from the bad stuff. 